Mai Mai Haru Mai to the Far Few Podcast, which invites people from all walks of life to converse about various access to equity within the context of Aotearoa. Uh, we invite um, you and our guests today, which we are so thankful for, to share our lived ex- their lived experience and effort to find common friends, um, um, common threads within support systems, social networks, and knowledge that uplifts the collective human experience. Kelsey, what's our season two question? So this season we are exploring what does equity and knowledge look like for various communities coexisting within one society. As Tauiwi and Aotearoa, we recognise the mana whenua and kaitiaki of these lands. Malusil and I have experienced most of our growth in the Waikato and want to honour Ngāti Hawa, Ngāti Mahana and Ngāti Wairere. We are grateful for the connections our whakapapa weaves through for us to be able to connect and grow and with community through the Whaku Kaupapa. Malusil and I would also like to honour our queer ancestors who fought for our rights and visibility as equitable citizens of the world. Kia ora, my name is Kelsey and I use they them pronouns. Noa Maori Otoasa Maluseo. Hey everybody, my name is Maluseo and people use he him pronouns for me. And today you already know we don't even introduce our guests, we allow them to share exactly who they are. So we're just gonna pass the mic over to Wanda. Please do your thing. Uh, uh, Malo Soifua Tala for lava, um Faftaiti Lava, uh Olo Ingo Wanda Yermia Allen. Um what will to my tight sa more? Um I am uh, Wanda Yermia Allen and my um and I would like to be referred to, I guess, as mother, sister, cousin, daughter, granddaughter, um of many people in my community, I guess. So Fafte Lava, awesome Malusu, Fafte Lava Kelsey for this amazing opportunity. Look forward to chatting more. Yes, thank you so much. And yes, so um, you 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 mentioned a little bit around um your communities in terms of um from Samoa. Where specifically are you rooted in place and space? Yes, so um ancestrally um my my immediate I affiliate with my immediate grandparents' villages, which are Sapali and Savai, um Salwafata, um, um in Aana, um Lalomanu in Alipata as well, um, at all I should say, um, and then Matau uh, Tufale Alili as well for my dad, um, who else have I missed? No, that's it, yes, so a, a wide range of villages really, and of course my great-grandparents have their own villages, their own connections as well, which even goes further and further and further, and and um, Yes, it's an invariably when someone says, oh, I'm from this village, I'll ask them, oh, actually, I do have a, a connection to that village as well, you know. It goes back to that proverb that um, e tili a'a o le tangata i loa a'a la a'a, there are more roots to a person than they are to a tree. So, yes, um, whenever I meet a Samoan person, I'm always asking, who, who are their people? Who are your people? Are they my people? Invariably they are. So which connection, which generation and link are we connected through? Mm. Which is cool. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Love that. And shout out to all of those people that you that are um, that you represent because uh, we already know you come as you come as many, not as one. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally, absolutely. And uh, and everything that I do, I guess, is that way inclined and having children as well who are biracial and you know one of the important things is the ngangana which they could be better at of course and that's uh emphasis on me on improving but what are the emphasis i always say to them is you know which is a samoan is known by the way that they carry themselves right so it's the way that you walk the way that you talk um the way that you um, conduct yourself through your interactions with your community is important. So yes, so being Samoan, I guess, is uh, language is important. Ancestry is great, but it's also the way in which you carry your ancestors, eh? That mm. responsibility. Delicious. <laughs> that see, I can I can swim in a pool of that for a while, yeah. and, and it will be still it'll be enriching me for a long while. So thank you for gifting that to us, and that that proverb is so potent, at the, and it's a healthy reminder actually for me, very much. Mm. What about you, Kels? Yeah, for sure, it's definitely yeah connection with various parts of 
my community is definitely really important to me um, and I guess that proverb kind of illustrates that in, mm. in a way that I, I've not heard before today so thank you for sharing. Mm. And I'm really attracted to the embodiment. It's about the ngangana. It's about the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you move. And that's mm. something that I feel like, yeah, it gets a little bit misconstrued when we're, we're too busy theorizing or trying to talk about it. And I'm like, actually, there's a time for talking and there's a time for walking. And mm. um, if, if your ngangana is innate, I like, can mm. you speak more about that? Like, wh- wh- what is the embodiment of your ngangana? Yeah. So... so- and it's a really interesting question that's come up with some discussions with some of, of, of our students in Pacific literature in which um, a lot of our students are of Pacific heritage, of multiple heritages, in fact, and this tension about the language, about not feeling Samoan enough, not feeling Indigenous enough because we have these multiple threads. And and I think then that the, the contention was on the word half-caste, you know, so half caste of course is a very loaded uh, eugenics term that comes with colonial Samoan, German colonial Samoan. And so while that term has carried different meanings and evolved into different um, different ways and been rejected or uh, reformulated by different communities over time, it still nonetheless for me has very raw um, expressions of eugenics that that says and because I am from a, a colonial Samoa where only the kids with a lot the English or German last names will have access to the top classes it was still very loaded for me and so it formed a lot of really critical discussions in class about what being a half caste or biracial biracial meant and it was a really powerful proverb to share with them to say you embody your ancestry, whether it's through um, your language acquisition, whether it's through the way in which you engage with um, people. That's really important because I know lots of Samoan people who are all textbook Samoans, you know, they, they know the, you know, really great at, at um, understanding the language, but the actual concepts of those things, of those, um, the way we do things, are lost. So people do things for the sake of doing it because it says in the textbook or someone has always done it this way, but the meanings of particular cultural practices are often lost. And so that's why it's really important for me to say it's the way in which you carry yourself expresses the way that you are Samoan. Because you can, your, your mangana is can be, you know, perfect, technically perfect, but if you don't actually understand what those words mean and how they relate to particular cultural practices, then, yeah, you, you don't have that richness of appreciating who you are and why and why those things are in place. That makes sense? Mm, for sure. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Again, I can mull on that and, and swim in that comfortably for a while. Yeah, because I think... It's really amazing that um, language acquisition is, is and revitalization is really amazing, is incredible, and I'm all for it. Um, and when we're in diasporic communities, you know, there's always this tension about, you know, having to work a job and contribute to local communities and come together as a family. There's always tension to that because we're also time poor. But we, when we actually appreciate why we do those things, the actual value in coming together as families, you know, the re- reason why, you know, we have to maybe give a cousin or an uncle fifty dollars because they might need it for something else. There's, it goes beyond the monetary value, you know. But so you understand this when we, we the whole notion of repatriate, repatriating money, you know, when there's a big family thing, it's. It's not just about the money, it's about the aroha, it's about being connected, it's about saying, hey, look, um, this is the freedom to allow you to do whatever you want to do. And so, yeah, so that's, you know, um, I guess, the forms of embodiment of what it means to be someone, mm. to me. Beautiful. And see, to me, I really love, I feel like you're probably the first um, person that that's, that's, that's spoken of the money exchange and more so the value exchange. 
mm-hmm. um, that that because it's like I've never heard it from the perspective of being like actually no, the mon- the value exchange is saying hey this is this is an opening for you to go and do something this is a, this is like a gate or a door for you to do mm-hmm. something with yourself um, for love you know and it's not mm-hmm. it's not something like that so I, I never actually heard it from that perspective so I'm really really thankful for that actually. Um, and you've actually already spoken a little bit on the, our first um, um, question, but we wanted to just basically offer it again to see if there's anything else that catches for that fishing net of mm-hmm. being like, what is knowledge to wonder? How is like what what is knowledge to you? Because you have already dropped a, 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 like a lot a mm-hmm. lot within your first um, couple of shares, and there yeah. is knowledge walking through your yeah. and yeah. um and very much through family knowledge. But what is knowledge yeah. specifically for Wanda? I guess for me, knowledge is a feeling. You know, knowledge is a feeling of belonging. Knowledge for me is understanding my place, understanding tikanga, understanding when I must engage and when I should not engage. So knowledge is being being safe and confident in my body to say, I understand the world this way. This is the way that I participate. I know that you understand the world this way and I'm going to hold you accountable for that because um, this is our shared understanding and our shared space. And it goes back to ultimately um, what we call the va, the sacred spaces, right? So the va tapuia, which is a sacred space, occurs, um, you know, in most Pacific communities about the sacred space that is created by two people or different beings, the understanding that between you and I, there are rules of engagement. You know, I respect you as a brother, you respect me as a sister, I respect you as the son of all these amazing ancestors from Tuvalu um, and Rotuma. You know, I I have connections with you, you know, as a fellow student, you know, as a fellow Pacific uh, Pasi studies um, um, Fano. So, those are the kind of sacred spaces that we engage, you know. So as such, there are rules in which we don't do things, silly things. We don't, you know, cuss or swear or do things that that bring, um, that just don't make sense to our community, that brings a bit of, hmm, to our, to our people because ultimately those are the people that, that we also acknowledge when we're walking. So knowledge for me is a warm fuzzy. It's a feeling of being connected of uh, playing a part um, and that is through an exchange of emotions, exchange of of ideas, exchange of whakapapa um, and yeah and and mutual interests I guess. So that's my very lofty way of <laughs> of discussing knowledge. <laughs> so it's a feeling, ultimately knowledge for me is a feeling of belonging. Yeah, it's really interesting because I've not heard knowledge be described like that before. Um, and you've you've kind of talked about that connection with people, and uh, in academic spaces. But I'm curious if there's like other ways of how you acquire knowledge. Like, is there other opportunities for you in other spaces outside of academia or within academia like how do you acquire knowledge yeah so so with my um my current research project so i'm a phd student in the faculty of Māori indigenous studies and um for years i've I've always tried to identify the one topic that will be bring will have meaning to me that will inspire me to really delve into something that will bring value to my community. Um, so my masters was done on on Rasta theology, on Black theology and reggae music because a lot of my friends were practicing reggae music and my family was immersed in that scene. Um, yeah, so I was asking a few critical questions and then. That led me into asking other ideological questions about Christianity and um, how Samoans use Judeo-Christian Christianity, um, Christianity. So the way that I acquired knowledge in that respect was then identifying, well, what do I want to know? How do I get the things that I want to know? And who do I contact? So my topic, my PhD topic is 
um, based on a London Missionary Society paper that was in a publication from 1839 and it still runs today, 181. But it was a very low, low-key newspaper that was circulating amongst members of the London Missionary Society that were spread all throughout the Pacific, you know. So it's phenomenal to actually think that, you know, these Tuvaluans, Tokelauans, uh, New Vanuatu, New Caledonian people were all writing and reading in the Samoan Gangana, right? So it was me to then look at, because, oh my gosh, you know, it's not, it may be in English. I mean, it may not be in English. It's actually in Samoan, but it's a link that we see that other people have been talking about, you know, like the whole Sea of Islands, the sociopolitical ideology that Hawafa has been talking about. You know, people, it's not a new idea. People were doing this all the time, you know, over a millennia, you know, people were connecting. It's just the ideological frames are different. So I was really interested as a central depository of that knowledge, which was in a newspaper. It was, you know, of course it's a, it's a, church propaganda but i refused to believe it was a church just a church propaganda i saw it as a place where indigenous people were really wrestling with what it means to be indigenous person working in christian spaces and in Samoan spaces so one of the so for me um identifying that newspaper where it was who published it where it was located um so acquiring that newspaper took me probably to most of the libraries here in New Zealand and getting my, my dear supervisor, the amazing Wahine Toa, uh, Associate Professor Alastair Buna Somerville. Come on. Uh, yes. Come on. Um, getting her to please pop into a library when she's doing keynote speeches all over the world just to see if you can find a collection for me. Um, so it was, it was making those connections and taking digital copies of those newspapers and then putting it all together into a central depository, which I now have, which is probably the biggest one that exists. And um, even the church doesn't have it, the London Mystery Society in London and the library there. Um, they've lost most of their copies because during World War II, of course, the bombings, you know, so the, most of the libraries um, were bombed during... World War II in London and most of our archival records went with it so I'm really privileged to now do the work where we recenter our Indigenous voices and bring this newspaper together to make meaning of it right to start the discussions about what did Indigenous people really think when they were exposed or when they um, adopted Christianity you know, how do we see particular tensions? And so what that meant then was to me, not only to bring it together, but then write about what that meant for me. And this is really strictly just my interpretation. It's not the be all or end all of, you know, the interpretation of this newspaper. But as the amazing um, Alice has said, you leave the door open and leave room for someone else to do the, the other mm. work as well. So I'm certainly of that kaupapa and Malafsi knows of these significant values and and responsibilities to doing this mm. important mm. work. No, yeah, that's so, good. I really love that. Um, I also feel like there is that, it, it's almost like it's the response and the ability as well, more so of, mm, of the conjoint word, um, nice. the response, how are we able to response back and forth and response in a way that's 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 reciprocal, reciprocal response. Mm. And then what is our re reciprocal ability? Because I feel mm. like that part really exploded my mind of being like, what? Because, mm. you know, <laughs> well... Me being a male, I'm I'm used to a certain type of response and a certain type of ability that suits and befits me, yeah. and that was humbly <laughs> shaken yeah. when I when I when I when I had to 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 really assess about what does reciprocal response mean, what does reciprocal yeah. abilities mean. Yeah. Uh, let's assess the yeah. the room, as you were saying yeah. before, in yeah. terms of who's in the room. Let's mm. assess the room. Yeah. But what was really interesting to me is, do you um, do you want to just stretch a little bit further around um, the conversation around LMS? Um, mm -hmm. Because um, I feel like in my in, in in my conversations and wayfinding a lot of the um, the the writers that were writing in the eighties, the seventies, the sixties, and um, from a Rotuman lens, everything about writing 
would have been demonized as like the lazy man's job because you went outside doing the work, you went outside doing physical work within the community, but you were like in a different space and it was you were you were almost writing the new imaginaries for us mm. to, to now converse with right now mm. in 2021. Mm. But do you mm. want to talk about the tensions of being like, you know, the village life, family life, and then to be a writer in that space, mm. and especially to be a writer for the church, mm. completely different perspectives. Mm. And it's also like, the, like for mm. me, I'm, I'm, I'm weaving together. There's a complexity in mm. that space, totally. but I'm just wanting to know, is that something that you found or is that something that yeah. um, was naturally there or how, how did that manifest for you? Yeah, totally. And it's uh, one of the key struggles that I've had with this newspaper, Malusia, was is the presence and the absence, right? You know, mm. so I, I would look at the newspaper and go, okay, so where's my great grandmother? Where are her voices? You know, because I'd look across, I would track this newspaper to see, okay, so predominantly, and the, again, this is kind of me making it all about me. It was like, Actually, you know, my Samoan is really good. I actually really understand this stuff. I can engage. I understand all these terms. And it was really humbling to realize that actually, for the first 30 years of that period that you really enjoy, were actually written by European missionaries. It was their Samoan. <laughs> it was actually Samoan. So it was, it was real basic Samoan. And, and then in the 1930s, it came into the real deep language, the language specialists, eh? These are the people who were really immersed in the in the culture. They were picking up the technologies of writing as a form of expressing their knowledge base, merging oral traditions with writing technology. Eh? So a lot of these people who were actually writing in this prestigious newspaper were often leaders of the community. So they'll often be ministers, they'll often be orators, they'll often be chiefs. And to an extent, I got a little bit tired of that, thinking, okay, well, this is really amazing. You know, you guys are deep thinkers. You are writing critical and creative um, stuff that is really important scholastically. But where are the women? You know, where are my mothers? Where are my grand aunties? And, and then being able to actually read the newspaper to understand, okay, well, there's actually a reason why only maybe a 20th, 20th, 20% of the paper actually written by Indigenous women is because there's sacred spaces there, a tikanga involved with the writing of practices, right? So for me, it was like, okay, of the 20% of female writers in that paper, what were they writing about? How can I read other women's voices through their writing? And then I realised, actually, there's a particular some worn way of reading the va reading how these women were expressing themselves and then not only that expressing how the men were writing about the women so i soon recognized that a lot of the writing by missionaries from overseas at the center of their concerns wasn't about christianity wasn't about you know the the personal visceral and, and embodied endangerments it was actually about their wives and their children you know, so I was like, oh my gosh, this is a real key factor on how people were engaging with text. Even if there was not a presence of women writing, there was nonetheless the presence of women all throughout the newspaper. Mm. Because men were writing, their ultimate concerns were about their wives, about their female children, about their mothers, about the, the lead women in their village pastorates. And this is beautifully retold through missionary reports, obituaries, you know, the, the beautiful way in which um, a lot of these women are described. It was like, oh, my gosh, it's almost like they're godlike, they're saint-like, which is, you know, it's in, an, in another discourse, of course. But nonetheless, it's a really beautiful way to see the presence of women that's not just in the text, but through the text. Mm. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so one of the things that's been really interesting also is tracing the presence of women in these colonial and um, patriarchal paternal texts is actually understanding the roles that they're playing in the newspaper, understanding they're actually in their little pieces of writing, which are often around children's literature or um nurses travels to PNG or 
a women's committee or the development of new post-World War II genres is the fact that these women were actually massive moral authorities. They were massive. They weren't the political pushers like their brothers were, but they were nonetheless this, this moral, spiritual protector that they had always been. And this is the kind of understated role that Malusu, you and I were talking about when it comes to our mothers, right? The invisibility of the labour, you know, the invisibility of the spiritual shields that they provide for us. We don't see it, but we feel it, right? Mm, mm. And so this is the way that I've read the newspaper. It's like, okay, so what are the ways in which our mothers were providing the spiritual protection to us? They were doing it by you know, these other different ways. Hmm. So I, I lost sight of the question, sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're on par. You're, you're on, on par. You're on par. <laughs> you're doing really, really well. Um, and I just want to offer you the fact that you know that, that like, the, the word is invisibility because mm. you can't see it and, it and it actually relates back to what you're saying about knowledge as being felt is that every time I was under my, my, my every time I was in proximity to my, to my, my, my pinga, my mapping mm-hmm. honey, my nana, complete safety, and like my mm-hmm. nana would would kill for in for anything for me. So I could do no wrong in front of my nanas, and that's yeah. a safety that that I believe a lot of us as males we forget, you know. And I, yeah. and and for me, and what I won't speak of all males, but for me, I forgot that that was the safety I had, so that I can be the best me. You know, I, I could I could walk and do and and say and 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 act and behave as as the best me because of that spiritual safety and the invisible mm. space, you know, yeah. and the invisible va yeah. is that yeah. those are the things that really helped me understand that I'm not actually this is this is a privilege, you know, and mm. you know, for when you forget your connection, you forget mm. your your bond <laughs> and you mm. forget those those things. Well I did well like similar to the in, in a fashion to the way I did. It, it it really it made me assume that I deserved this and I mm. needed this and I I have a right to this mm. and it's such mm. a beautiful thing for you to to share that because you 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 do it with such grace because mm. <laughs> I already know mm. that you probably would have been in spaces and places where the, mm. this is just being like wow is yeah. this a TV show of what I already yeah. know. <laughs> But, it, but it's uh, just picking up on that amazing point as well, Malusu, about you and your grandmother, your mapinga, is, mm. you know, that whole sense of invisibility, eh? these secret spaces where, you know, quite often, you know, prior to lockdown, every Sunday I'll prepare myself, my dad, a meal, and I'll take it up to Auckland so I can share a meal with him every Sunday. And often while we're having the meal and after the post-meal when we're too full, there's often a long patch of silence where we're just sitting. Mm. You know, mm. and then, and then one of my kids said, the ten year old goes, "Oh, what you guys do is just sit, you know, <laughs> quietly. We just sit. We're just reading. We're just, you know, occasionally we'll, there will be a question and there will be silence, but it's companionable silence, right? That's in, in in those silent spaces. A lot of things are actually happening. You know, for me, I like to think, and I don't want to speak on behalf of my dad, is the affi, the acknowledgement that I've gone to acknowledge my dad, I've gone to sit with him quietly, be in his presence, absorb, you know, absorb his knowledge, absorb his presence, absorb all the figurative things that he represents to me, and just in that companionable silence. And so I fill my bucket, my emotional bucket and my spiritual bucket up, and then come back for in the evening ready for a new week. So it's those companionable, silent, invisible things that are happening, eh? And I think we um, we probably need to appreciate them a little bit more because in the in the haze of commodifying knowledges, of you know wanting to grasp this right and left, right and centre, we tend to forget the actual magic happens in those quiet, invisible spaces. I think so. That that is what knowledge is for me a feeling that occurs when you just don't have to explain yourself and at the same time feeling safe to ask things that you don't understand of that person in that space. I just I just want to take a pause there and acknowledge 
that massive that was massive koha for me um because i uh i have never been able to articulate why i enjoy just sharing space with people mm. and the way that you've you've articulated that now is just like that's it and i've never had the words for it for for it before so thank you for that that's so it's really beautiful <laughs> <laughs> I know, but that's what it is, eh? Because I think what happens is we forget that everyone has mana, right? Everyone has power, even if it's quiet power, it's still power, right? And we need to learn to, you know, stop it and sh- shut up sometimes, <laughs> and just connect, even if it's just sitting and having a cup of coffee. Even if it's just reading a book, you connect it. It's just saying, hey, look, I'm here. <sighs> so I'm crying because I haven't seen my dad in three months. Oh. <laughs> 15th of December. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, so I, 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 and see, your 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 story there drove me back to, to to Rituma straight away, sitting at the veranda after a long day's work, and we're all having a cup of tea, and no one's talking, and everyone's and everyone's just absorbing the the silent conversations, the silent yeah. hugs, the silent laughter, the silent um, hurt, the silent um, everything. And it's yeah. it's it's a beautiful thing when the wind talks for you, totally. or when when the, the the sea talks for you, um, and for not so much for or on behalf, but more so with and 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 through you, mm-hmm. and through each other, and through the people that are in the room, and that's 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 I have to admit that's that's what I was um. That's what I was missing in, in the lockdowns is that I didn't know, and because I was too busy trying to be, yes, it, I'm okay, you're not, you, you don't need, you know, your people are with you. And it's like, yes, your people are with you. And you can miss physical people in the room. Because yeah. <laughs> in my head, I was in the, in the binaries of, you can't have both. And I'm like, Whew, who wove that for you? <laughs> yeah, totally, eh? Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about that. Just being, you know, just being, owning who you are, owning owning the beautiful complexities that are us with all our connections. Because, you know, you may feel at times you're not connected, but just in those quiet moments, quiet contemplations, even reading a text, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so connected to the way that, that person has felt or I'm not alone or someone else has thought this so I'm connected to the person who thought that and wonder how they engaged with that particular turmoil or incident and I guess that's that's the reason why I've been driven to archival research it's like leave me to my people <laughs> living people are too hard to deal with <laughs> Please, the noise. Please, Please the stop noise. talking. Stop the noise. Yes. Let me just go into the into the archives and let these old people tell me what they think hmm. and tell me what I don't know and how I can make sense of all these things. So, yes, I think being a natural introvert as well helps as well. And so part of being an introvert, my responsibility is to step out a little bit more. You know, I don't assume that my extroverted family can understand what I'm saying and understand why I get so infuriated <laughs> when they can't read my mind. <laughs> yeah. No, it's so interesting that you say that because it's it's so re- like for me I've never experienced you as an introvert, which is the which is the beauty of it. And I guess that's the that's the beauty of being in different spaces and places is I never experienced you as an introvert. And I can totally see what you mean now. <laughs> Where yeah. as soon as you said that word I was like, haha <laughs> Yes, I can see this. I didn't see this before, but I could see it now. And I love that you talked about the archive because that's that's definitely leading us into our next question in terms of where's knowledge hold or where do you hold your knowledge? Because you like you've literally already alluded it to being like, you know, 
stop the noise <laughs> and 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 we have talked about knowledge being held in the silence mm-hmm. so i guess i wanted to 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 gift more time into um where else is knowledge hold for, um held for you or is it in the body mind soul heart where where's where's where does knowledge where's the inventory or the li- library or nice. the archive of knowledge for you nice i like how you talked about embodiment i think i need to be more in tune with that in terms of the physical manifestations of the woes that I carry. And because I'm quite a spiritual person, like a lot of people, it's like, oh, you know, I can overcome anything. <laughs> but it's actually the physical manifestation often of of those woes and those traumas that I tend to forget. And I think it's also to do a lot with uh, Presbyterian uh, Christian upbringing where, you know, you've got to overcome this, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness and there's no other compromises. And so embodiment is something that I'm working with, working, trying to understand a little bit more in terms of my own personal journey, because I do, I totally agree. I don't think we listen to our bodies enough, particularly as an Indigenous person in a Samoan community where a lot of medical ailments, of course, you know, uh, are seen in all sorts of our communities, including members of my own family. I think that's my next journey, is to understand, okay, I need to look after, as an Indigenous person, I need to look after myself because ultimately is the physicality of my body is where that knowledge is going to be held. Mm. You know, it's in my mind, it's in my heart, it's in my soul. So I need to keep this vessel going for as long as I can so that I can impart what I know is as limited as they are to my kids or to the next person. Mm. So I think key, ultimately key, you're absolutely right, Malusia, was embodiment, is, you know, we've got to do the whole shebang. We've got to spiritually grow. We need to academically grow. But we need to couple that, couple that with a physical health as well. Um, so, yes, so... so in terms of archival spaces, that's where the text is held. In terms of spiritual development, it is, of course, you know, in my head and my, in the spaces of my head and my heart. And the way in which I need to, to, to share that will have to be in the writing, but also have to be in just moments, moments where you can share and engage with people because I've had so many experiences where the things that have really made sense to me is when someone has just quietly said something to me and it just all falls in place right you guys probably have the similar experience where you mean you've, like you've been doing to us this whole time yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure no it's like you know things that you've read things that you know mm. but then someone will say and you go really thought about in that way and it kind of just blows my mind so that's why I'm really open to conversation you know Mm. to talanoa to responsibilities of just getting over my my being whakamara and being socially awkward and just comfortably engaging in those spaces and and that's why it's been really valuable for me to know to see how much I've grown in this in the sheer space of 18 months to a month to six months, you know, I'm a completely different person in the way that I see knowledge and see my responsibility. It's a constant, constantly evolving thing. So yes, bodies is the manifestation or the vessel in which we carry a lot of that. And writing is key and sharing space. Mm. And hanging out with you amazing (laughs) fellas. That's so cool. See, I love that you're calling us fellas because literally that's 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 perfectly <laughs> us. That's literally us. <laughs> no, because I swear, is that? And then at the same time, when you talk about embodiment, I know for me it was, it was like I think there's an importance in in actually that being one of the first year papers or that being one of the what like something that yeah. we need to teach early on in in, 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 in in primary school or high school um or as early as possible on how to listen to your body how to yeah. how are you how are you absorbing knowledge and and then how are you absorbing experiences and how are you releasing knowledges and, and experiences because you know for me it was hard like when i say 
I only started this journey, this journey, um, probably halfway through the year in July when I quit or when when I had to take a career break, and my body wanted to refuse. My body just wanted yeah. to go back to the normal. My body went, and I couldn't actually hear when I was hungry or when I was thirsty mm. or when I was. I couldn't hear when I needed to spend alone time in isolation so that I can heal myself. I couldn't yeah. hear. Um, yeah. And it was because I was busying myself saying I'm important as a job, as a job status. I'm important because I'm studying or I'm important. And I'm like, mm. when am I important to me? Yeah. You know, and that, that was, that was a conversation that shifted my whole narrative because I haven't been important to me for a long time. Yeah. And I, it was, it was scary for me to, to realize that I haven't been leading the love of being like because I can talk about love to everything else yeah, totally. and I can spread the love that way and in and, and a, and a noisy way yeah and the way that I'm I'm, I'm 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 fashioning this but I was like in the silence of myself and me and and that's why I really love the um my name right now in terms of Maluseo, but also mm-hmm. the repurposing of, of my name in mm-hmm. terms of mull on you to see you. So it's oh. an invitation. My name is an invitation for me to mull on myself yeah. so that I can see myself better. So that yeah. I, and instead of going to people to try and find how I feel about myself or how I think about totally. myself or watching movies or watching, totally. uh, and I'm like, this, this is totally. sad. This is sad that I don't even rely on my own innate intuition yeah. To tell me how I am, yeah. to to show me or feel me how I am. Yeah. I've never actually said that before, so I don't know if that makes That's sense. Beautiful. But you, <laughs> oh, totally. no, I I totally get that. I think, yeah. I mean, there was an old, yeah. Okay, this is another long story, but go there, go there. <laughs> one of the really fascinating things I've really loved is you know having conversations with my children about that about self worth. And there's a really, I loved listening to India Iree, if, if you ever get a chance. I, you know, um, I think there was one, one of the songs was about video, something about video. But one of the keys in that, the lyrics in that song is, um, my, my self-worth is not determined by the price of my clothes. You know, so it was like, you know, that was, it was I know it's a really similarly oversimplified line, but it was really important for my for me to teach my daughters that, you know, because they were born when their album came out. So it was like, this is your theme song to the eldest child. This is your theme song. This is about self-worth. Actually, just you are your own queen. You are going to define who you are. It's not to, going to be your self-worth is not de- is not determined by someone else's value of you. You know, so it was like, oh, you know, that was and I know it's it's a, it's a line in the song, but it, it's exactly that what you're talking about, Marusu. It's about mm. defining our own self worth. You know, not having to because it's hard to do that because you and I are migrant children, right? We come from the islands where we have seen our parents. We've lived the indigenous life. We've lived communities. We've we've seen the big emphasis on doing better, of of going to bigger cities. To better yourself, to you know, pro- to make up the most of those amazing opportunities that possibly our parents, you know, and our grandparents never had. So when we get to these new, I, I know I don't want to speak for you, but for me, when I came to New Zealand, it was like I don't know what how to be in New Zealand. You know, I went to a a school where it was ninety five percent Balangi. I didn't just didn't know how to be. I wasn't a a brown kid. I mean, I was a. I wasn't a Maori kid. You know, I wasn't part of the four percent of Maori kids at my school. Completely different. You know, I was wasn't one of the four island kids because they were all diasporic kids. I actually grew. I'm a, a freshie from the islands. So a lot of my walk in life was actually trying to understand what was it. What does it. What does it mean for me to be in this place, on this land? Um, expressing who I am as a as a Samoan woman, and it yeah, and and I don't have the answers. I'm just for me, it's about place, acknowledging who I am, whose land I'm on, you know, my role as Manuhiri, you know, just just understanding this, coming to terms with the meanings of the practices that we do at home and what that means in in New Zealand. 
because in Samoa, when you go to someone else's village, you know, you are, you're a visitor. You know, you have to acknowledge the up of the land. Mm. You've got to listen, be respectful of all the multiple parties of that land. And so why would we choose to do things differently when we come to another place? You know, and we often tend to forget it because our views of Indigenous people here are mediated through the government, is mediated through, mm. you know, uh, another cultural lens, a white cultural lens that, you know, is foreign to yours. So... There's multiple layers of engagement on how hoops that you need to jump through to find who you are. So mm. it's a long way to say, yeah, your self-worth and your walk in life is totally is, is totally dependent on yourself. And that is fundamentally putting yourself forward and being accountable to who you are and your role on this particular land. So I, I love I love the way that you see that. Obviously, was I've got to put me first to understand where I'm placed. Yeah. And 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 that serves the community. Like to me it was I, I feel like it was it was hard for me to understand that yeah. being self selfish in this manner in terms of self accountability, self responsibility, um, self awareness serves the community. Because in my head I, I was too focused and I feel like that's where the binaries of all the limitations of my beliefs around self mm -hmm. was that if I was to be selfish, it would go against my innate abilities to serve the community. It would go mm -hmm. uh, like and serve my family and serve serve wh whoever I need to serve. And then I realized actually to serve the community is to actually show up authentically and radically myself. Yeah, and that that was something that wasn't taught to me innately, but it's like because of the way that, and I love. So I just want to bring back to your point around um, us coming through um, to to um, to New Zealand and 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 trying to weave a new way to 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 live mm -hmm. and to move and to embody mm -hmm. our Fakaro. Because when I came here, I literally was like, oh, I have to let go of everything on the island mm -hmm. because. No one understands it and no one's going to respect it. No one's going to love it. And the way that I've been fashioning it now is I'm like, actually, no, they've been living in Oroita, which is our um, our hidden sacred space until it's ready for them to come out. Mm. So that's how I've been, I've been repurposing that conversation. Yeah. But to your point as well around coming here, I felt a lot of guilt because I was feeling all of this internal struggle, um, mm. with, which you've already mentioned, and when I looked back, everybody else thought that it was a privilege for me to get here. And I'm like, I don't know how, like that was a tension conversation for so long mm. that, 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 that I couldn't have my struggle because mm. I was living in New Zealand and it was the land of richness and it was mm. the, 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 the greener mm. side of the fence. And I'm like, yeah. I, I, and I was like, I couldn't even tell, like, because when we when we talk about culture shock, I'm like, no, it's more like, I, I, like for me, I, ex I experienced more like culture genocide for a little mm -hmm. bit, you know, it was, it was because in the silence, which we would normally have mm -hmm. and in and, and, and proximity to other bodies, mm -hmm. we would be able to heal in the silence. But because mm -hmm. we were busy mm -hmm. and we had places and spaces to be at at certain mm -hmm. times, Mm -hmm. um, which is a choice. I, I forget that it was a choice for us to do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And now that we're at, like, I'm able to see that it's a choice. I'm able to actually hear more. That I'm mm -hmm. like, actually, I'm choosing these things that don't benefit me, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm being in places and spaces that don't mm -hmm. benefit me. So how do I create? Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like what Alice and Alice, we love you. You keep on mm -hmm. coming back to us because yeah. you're that potent. Yeah. But these different senses of the universe. So how do we create senses of the universe that's safe yeah. for us? And I'm like. That's why yeah. when Kelsey jumped on board, so the fucker papa of the um um fuck you podcast, Kelsey jumped in and was like, "Look, I want to do a podcast," mm -hmm. and I'm like, "I, I just knew, mm -hmm. I didn't have to think about it. I just mm -hmm. knew yeah. that it was the safest thing from for for me, and it was the most loving thing that I could weave yeah. in. And although the the co papa is name and all that, and I was like, actually no, the co papa name is a protective shield. If you don't want to yeah. look into that, yeah. you're not gonna feel the love and the wider and the safety of the yeah. of the of, of of what we're trying to create. Yeah. But if you yeah. if if you look at that and it's kind of like a reverse play on how I perceived self. Yeah. If you, if you didn't want to yeah. dive deeper into self, yeah. you're gonna always see it from the surface, shallow yeah. levels. Oh, totally, absolutely, and and I. And, I, and it ultimately is about owning your vulnerability, yeah, Marusil? You know, it's about owning your vulnerability and, and using that as a strength to say, hey, look, 
I'm not all these things that you want me to be. I understand the choices that you've made for me, but there's a point of realisation, of course, and many, for me, many decades, decades later, it's like, actually, I choose not to opt that way. I don't subscribe to the ideals of the 1980s that you've set upon every Samoan child who came on scholarship, you know, at 12 or 13 years of age. There's so many other different things that we can offer, right? Um, and I think it's coming that critical faculty like you're talking about, about, you know, when you talk about self, I think about critical faculty. It's about mm. questioning, right? It's actually being brave enough to stand up by saying, hey, look, let's talk about this. Let's think about this. I know it's it's not possibly the way that the group would would swim, but how about we think about this for a second? And I think that exactly as you say, being selfish, being critical is actually a responsibility of being a leader, mm. I think, is pushing boundaries, saying that, okay, our communities are as amazing as they are. These are conversations that we do need to have as a whanau. Whether it's touching upon a subject, whether it's resolving it, that's all dependent by you. But let's start that conversation. Let's make these, sa these spaces safe. So at least, you know, even if it's a silent nod, it's it's put into some child's, some person's um, consciousness that, hey, I'm not alone, you know. Yeah, these companionable silences do exist and maybe I can come out sometimes to talk about them. But the other people in similar positions as me. So well done, you two, Malisa and Kelsey. Thank you for providing these incredibly safe spaces for us to, Say it's all right. Being you is enough. Yeah. And Kelsey embodies that. So Kelsey yeah. embodies that to a point where, um, like, I might be the loud noise that, 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 that looks like he, they embody that, but Kelsey embodies that innately to yeah. a point where I feel so safe to be like, yep, we are leading with vulnerability and that's, 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 that's the T. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'll talk about Kelsey. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> They don't like it. See, they don't like. They don't like. <laughs> I'm learning to receive. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Rather than <laughs> that, I would have done six months ago. But yeah, I'm. I'm curious. You've talked on quite a few different things over over our time together. But what knowledge are you carrying with you into this into this next season of your life? What knowledge am I carrying into the next season? Yes. What knowledge am I taking into the next season? What knowledge I'm looking forward to taking into the next season is accepting that I have um, a more active role to play in terms of my own personal health um, that will benefit my community. So it's, again, getting fitter, you know, getting healthier, so that I spend more time with my kids and finish my PhD and learn more from other people and give more. So um, receiving and giving and building knowledge bases, uh, particularly with my, my project, but also building a community of amazing people who are doing this work, right? You know, because while I really bemoan the fact that there wasn't a Samoan group in the specific historical association that weren't kind of willing to come together. I realised, like Barack Obama, hey, look, I've got my whānau. <laughs> I already have my whānau, you know? The connection where I'm able to even speak in Samoan, ram ramble off and not realise I can do it, means that I'm, I already have those connections. Yeah. You know, so... Um, appreciating that more and I'm going to take into the future that is appreciating what I have building my writing building my relationships with myself as well as my community and and taking responsibility more active responsibility in, in that community I think does that make sense? yeah yeah, so they might not be tangible outcomes, but certainly those are the things that I am 
um, I'm, I am presently working on and looking forward to contributing more. And the effect would be yeah. profound. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm still mulling on that because that's literally, the, that, that's the work that's, that's, in, that's important for me now as well. So I just want to echo that. Um, that's the type of work that I'm, I'm, I'm attempting to, to, to sit with in conversations in the silent um, because, um, yeah, the, 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 the biggest part for me is very much how, how do these things operate in the silent and then how do they naturally inform me in, 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 the, in the noise because that's the part that I really enjoy and I can hear 100% the responsibility the, and it's, it's, it's coming back to you where you're like, where, how am I moving through this? How are we moving through this? Mm-hmm. And because like, so my beginning part of, to, to, to the embodiment and health work is literally I went and bought a plant and mm-hmm. I was like, okay, the more that I feed the whenua on this blood is the more that I'm going to be reminded that I feed my own whenua, aka my body. Because mm-hmm. so I've been fashioning my body of being like, look, she is beautiful. She's yeah. she's been she's been holding all of the stuff. Some stuff she needs to release. So it, if it so yes. if it's because I've been I've been releasing in terms of stories. So I've been releasing the stories of being like, okay, you can be big, bold, beautiful, and yeah. humble, and yeah. silent, and violent, yeah. and hurtful, yeah. and healing. Nice. And and all of these okay. things where instead of putting the but or the full stop, I put the comma and the and of being like, yes. there's more to this. This oh. body is carrying more, and um, and also this body needs to release a lot of stories as well because yeah. the stories have been crystallized and um. <laughs> We could almost call it arthritis in a way. <laughs> Being no. like the stories of yeah. crystallized in an arthritic, arthritis way where I'm like, okay, we need some water. So I've been talking to Kelsey's like, I'm like, I talk to my water all the time of being like, water, you've come to this vessel. You're going to flow into my body and you're going to go and dilute all of the, 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 the plot stories or the barriers or the stories within my system. So I've got this whole, like, when I say I'm, I'm full blown, Woo woo! Yeah, <laughs> I feel like you know that it's 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 the spiritual rituals that we do. Oh, totally! Mm. That is so poetic, Malusia and Kelsey. That's really beautiful. I love. You know what you just did for me then is you've you've just empowered the comma, the end, and the exclamation mark. You know, I just think, oh my gosh, that's so poetic. You need to write that down and share that as a poem. You know, no. the little seemingly innocuous comma and an exclamation mark all of a sudden have this massive agency to go, oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's incredible, the, the, the roles of those three things have done to express mm. who you are and this massive commitment and responsibility and love, you know. Mm. So tautoko, definitely tautoko that, love yes. that. Love that. I'm going to write that down today. No. <laughs> All right, and then so we we save this question for last because we were we we do want to make sure that this is not one of the leading questions that we have. But what is in your far queue? What is in your uh, in the back of your 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 conversations, or what's a conversation that you believe is is? And it could be we already mentioned it, and um, yeah. but I'm just I'm, I'm I'm wanting to highlight it again. If if there's anything else that pops up, um, is there something in your far queue, or that's a conversation that you're like. Mm, I can't wait to have, and it could be, you know, the conversation back with your, with 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 your with your father, and it's just a silent conversation. Mm. You know? So, I'm yeah. giving it over to you. Right. So that's a big one, mm. um, and it's it's the undercurrent. I would say the undercurrent. It's the premise of my entire project, which is where do Indigenous archives belong? Where should they be placed? So in particular, I'm talking about this newspaper that I've accumulated, right? This massive body of work that I've, over 400 issues of this digital archive that I've taken upon myself um, via the amazing project of Alice Tapuna Somerville named Indigenous Texts, Writing writing the New World, Indigenous Texts, 1900s to 1975. Um, Big shout out to that amazing project. Um, But the massive question I have in my FAQ is, where, where will I take this? Where, who should I, who's going to be the next kaitiaki of this, this archive? Does it sit in a public depository so that everyone whose ancestors, um, the, the descendants of the 
of the writers can publicly access it? Or does it go back to the church institution who have just so been resistant to anyone doing this work because they want, you know, they this they protect it thinking it's an institutional archive when it's not. So this is the big question that I've had. Um, I've had, um, I'm sure people don't mind me saying this is in out of respect to the church. I've had conversations about, earlier conversations about where this should go. First, primarily of why we're doing this work and after explaining my relationship with it, I received their blessing. But the bigger question for me then is like, who do I who do I repatriate this to? Who do I give it to? Can I trust institutions to make it available to everyone? Or should I just put it out online and share it with anyone and everyone who can actually publicly go and search their own ancestors and find out about their own family histories, right? Because mm. um, their fam- this is a family archive too. There have been multitudes of family who's whose lives have been immersed in church work, who've travelled as far, and and a lot of the, the writing and obituaries, lengthy obituaries are there, are, are often forgotten family stories. And so it's with that emphasis that I am more inclined to say, no, I'm going to give it to a national library somewhere, whether that's in Samoa or New Zealand, I, with the guarantee that it's going to be publicly available to everyone. So that's the really big um, big question in my FAQ at the moment. Oof. We're gonna we're gonna put put that into the into this into the VAR so that it can traverse to different hearts and be manifested in different spaces and places because that's so potent. That's such a potent conversation. And I'm so thankful that you're willing to offer your time, effort and energy from this round to, 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 to really cater to that question because mm-hmm. I believe that question is a very necessary, like it's a necessity and in, 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 not only in your space, but I feel like in the wider Oceania, it's very much a, a conversation that, mm-hmm. that we, we've been waiting for to have oh, it. And I feel definitely. like other people have had different agencies for that question, yeah. yet now we're able to, to move with the question as opposed mm. to being like shame in the hidden dark spaces, having little yeah. conversations. Yeah, <laughs> totally, right? Because mm. it's, it, it's not just ours, it's everyone's, you know? It's not some old stuffy tomb-like archive that was bombed in London, you know, that look what happened there. You know, these things are, they are, they are living. They, they need to be taken out of the tomb-like, you know, entombed archives of Western imperialism into the hands of our people, you know. And people will make these, these, these stories lived again. You know, it's like we're putting flesh back onto the bones of underrepresentation or invisibility, right? Love so, that poem as well. Oh, oh yeah. amazing. So, so that's that's what we're doing with all our work is we're doing meaningful work for our people. Hmm. Um and and enjoying it and loving it and thriving. Um and being guided by it as well. So yes, that's in the big far queue. Who does this belong to? Indigenous archives versus colonial um, institutional archives. Hmm. Delicious. Amazing. And if people want to get in touch with you or they resonate with your conversation, yeah. um, and they um, and, you know, and you've got your whānau, your your ngana sat more whānau that's actually yeah. um listening, um, how is the best? Uh, how's what's the best way to get, uh, reach out to you? Yeah, so I guess they can look me up at the university, University of Waikato, um, an email address. Um, I will probably provide that to Kelsey so that you know yeah. she can Kapai. send that to anyone who's really interested in this work and really inviting people who have the social linguistic skills to be able to do a lot of this archival week work please think about it because you know this is this is a work of this is our intellectual inheritance right yeah so claiming that is, claim yeah, that whānau. this is ours and, and and the work is waiting for you to 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 come in and and engage with it <sighs> love that mm-hmm. yeah so whānau, if you want to jump in um like let us know and we'll connect you with Wanda. Mm. 
No, that's yeah. good. Well, we started with a jingle. Can we end with a jingle? So at least that way we can uh, jiggle it off. <laughs> All right. Do, 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 fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Hey, fuck you. Do, 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 fuck you. Fuck you. The fuck you. Awesome, Kodua. Malo, fuck you. Kia ora. Thank you so much, Wanda.